This sermon is titled Book Study Acts chapters 19 and 20 Be enriched as you listen All right morning everyone Are you still happy <laughs> All right so this last two months we've been journeying through the book of Acts we've been covering two chapters every Sunday and the way we are doing it is we read those chapters before we come to church to the service and then that sunday we co- we we just bring in some highlights and explanations on those two chapters so we are in acts chapters 19 and 20 i hope you've read it before you came in case you didn't that's okay you can go back and read it and uh, also listen to the message and and, and draw insight so in acts chapter 18 the previous chapter towards the end of that chapter was chapter uh, chapter 18 around verse 21 22 Paul had completed his second missionary journey and he traveled all the way back to Caesarea from there he went up into Jerusalem spent a little bit of time there and then he moved back to Antioch which was his home church or his home base he spent some time there and immediately almost immediately he didn't take too much time off almost immediately he started off on his third missionary journey so we saw that already towards the end of acts chapter 18 so we are now in AD 53 on for the next 4 years the apostle paul is on his third missionary journey so this third missionary journey is it was longer than his previous journeys four years third missionary journey so ad 40 53 to ad 57 so if you look at the map there of his third missionary journey you see that he leaves from antioch in syria the northern part of syria he travels by land he goes through the district of cilicia where was tarsus his home city he grew up there so he goes back By this time remember there are churches in all these regions and what is interesting in his third missionary journey is that Paul does not go into any new areas in his first missionary journey second missionary journey it was new territory going into new places preaching the gospel establishing churches but in his third missionary journey he just goes back to all those churches that he had previously established to strengthen those churches. So he goes back to Tarsus and then from there he moves into the region of Galatia where you have these tri cities of Derby, Lystra and Iconium strengthening the believers there. He moves uh, continues westward towards the districts of Phrygia and Pisidia and that's where you have the city of Antioch, the uh, Antioch of Pisidia strengthen the believers there. And then he continues west and he comes to the city the port city of Ephesus on the west coast of Turkey so where is paul right now yeah I'm just check it <laughs> so we are with paul now at ephesus now paul does something unusual that he's never done before he spends 3 years in one city So three years at Ephesus. So imagine this is the bulk of his time in his third missionary journey, right there in one city. But that's very, very interesting, and it's just amazing how God worked through all of this. How God guided him. Obviously, Paul was listening to God and following His instructions. But three years at Ephesus, and as we journey through Acts nineteen and twenty, we will see the outcome of what have of that time at Ephesus. But let's talk a little bit about the city of Ephesus itself. The city of Ephesus historically was established about 1000 years before Christ. 1000 years before Christ. So it wasn't a new city. Uh historically, uh they don't know exactly how the name came, but they believe uh, historically it's understood that there was a particular tribe and that tribe named this port city after their prince princess Ephesia. And that's how the name of the city came Ephesus. But Ephesus as a port city was an extremely important city in the Mediterranean. 
It was a trading center, obviously. Uh, you know, ships coming in and out. Uh, so very important from a point of commerce. And over hundreds of years, it had changed hands from many different world empi uh, empires, from the Persians on to the Greeks and on to the Romans. So it was, had a mix of cultures in that, primarily the Greeks and the Romans. So when Paul came in, Ephesi uh, Ephesus, Ephesi Ephesus was, was a booming city and probably at its peak uh, in terms of what was happening in the city. Under the Roman government or the Roman empire, especially under, under Claudius C Augustus, uh, this city reached is its pinnacle, its height. And uh, there were great architectures there. You could see in the picture, uh, you're seeing the picture of the library in that city. And of course, all of these things are ruins today. But you can see what was there, what was built there by the Greeks and the Romans uh, over generations. Now, from a Christian biblical standpoint, Ephesus is also very important because Paul spent three years here. But not only that, but John, the beloved apostle, is said to have come and lived here in Ephesus. And who do you think was with him? Who was he supposed to take care of? Jesus gave responsibility to John to take care of Mary, his own mother. So, Historically, from a biblical perspective, a Christian perspective, the city of Ephesus is important because John, the apostle, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, spent their last days here. And it was from Ephesus that John, the beloved, so he, he wrote the gospel of John, the uh, three epistles of John from Ephesus. And shortly after that, he was banished from Ephesus, over into the agency, into a remote island called Patmos, west of Ephesus. And it's over there that the Lord gave him the book of Revelation. And the first church the Lord Jesus is addressing is the church here in Ephesus. So even from a Christian biblical perspective, Ephesus is a very important city because of all these things that took place. Now going back to Ephesus at Paul's time, Ephesus was a city that was dedicated to the goddess. The Greeks referred to her as Artemis. The Romans referred to her, her, her expression as Diana. So the temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was built with pure white marble. It took over 200 years to build that temple. It had a marble pavement leading up to the temple. It was a massive thing. And that was dedicated to the goddess Artemis or referred to as Diana by the Romans. So Ephesus as a city had a divinity goddess, was dedicated to the goddess Diana. Are you with me? And this goddess was the goddess of fertility, of childbearing. So they all worshipped her. That was her, uh, one of the main attributes of, of what, what she gave, childbearing. And so now, when you read 1 Timothy chapter 2, which was one of Paul's final epistles, which he wrote from prison in Rome, he wrote to Timothy, who was pastoring the church in Ephesus. In 1 Timothy 2, 14, 15, he says, he's talking about Christian women. He says, when, when you walk in submission to your husbands and all of that, you will be saved in childbearing. Ah, why did he write that? Because many of these people who are believers there, not all of them, some of them were Jews, but many of them were Greeks, non-Jews. Non they were worshippers of the goddess Diana, the goddess of fertility, of childbearing. But now they are believing in Jesus. And Paul is pointing them to Jesus. God will take care of your childbearing. You don't need to go to goddess Artemis or Diana. Are you with me? That's a little background to why he's stating that. 
I'm not saying that's the only reason. There's obviously um, a, a more theological, biblical reason, but that's the cultural context he's addressing. And he's saying, you don't need, Im- implying that you don't need to go to God as Diana. The God of heaven will take care of you in your childbearing. You understand? That's the context for them, for those people. They understood what he's saying. Because they were worshippers previously of goddess Diana, who was the goddess of that city. And so, Acts, beginning of Acts 19, Paul comes in to Ephesus. Now, remember in Luke 8, Acts 18, before, at the, towards the end of his second missionary journey, Paul had left Aquila and Priscilla at Ephesus. So they were there. And so he comes there and they, they already had a church going in their house. And Paul is now coming back to Ephesus. Remember in Acts 18, he said, I will come back if the Lord wills. And here he is in Ephesus. And when he comes, he meets about 12 men who were disciples. They were disciples of Jesus, but they only knew up until the baptism of John. John pointed to Jesus. So they understood the baptism of John and they were followers of Jesus, but they didn't know more than that. So Paul asks them a very interesting question. Have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? So it's teaching us something. That in the early church, and as we have seen earlier in the early chapters of the book of Acts, that when people came to faith in Christ, they were baptized, but they were also led to receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So obviously you're born again because the Holy Spirit comes in you. Paul wrote about that, that the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. You're born of the Spirit. But there is this second experience that you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul's talking about. He's asking them a direct question. So we ask each other the question, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Have you received the Holy Spirit? After you've become a believer, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Paul asked that question. Some people say, no, 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 there's only one Holy Spirit. Yeah, there's only one Holy Spirit, but there are two experiences we have. Many experiences we have. One Holy Spirit. So that's what we ask. Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? If not, we'll do what Paul did. What did he do? So to these people, he taught them about Jesus. About being baptized in water in the name of Jesus. Because they only knew John's baptism. And he prays for them. Acts 19 verse 6. So they all believe, in, believe that. They're, they are baptized in water in the name of Jesus. And the next thing he does, Acts 19 6, he says, he laid hands on them and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled with the Spirit and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 men. It doesn't say how many women and children. Maybe they had other family as well. But they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit, spoke with tongues and prophesied. Amen. So we continue this practice today. And that's why here at ABC, you know, every other month we have one Sunday, we, one, one month, we, first Sunday we do water baptism. The other month we do Holy Spirit baptism. So we're just following what they were doing in the book of Acts. Are you listening? Right? So Paul prayed for them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it says there, Acts 19, uh, 8, For three months, he was teaching in the synagogues. That's normally what he did. He would begin in the synagogues, trying to reach the Jews, inform the Jews, try to preach to them, reason with them about Jesus Christ. But there he faced so much opposition. They wouldn't take it. And so he left the synagogue, and very interesting, verse 8, he goes into the school of Tyrannus, the a lecture hall of a man called Tyrannus. Now, we don't know too much about Tyrannus, but we could make some assumptions because he had a lecture hall. He must have been a lecturer. He must have been some sort of a teacher. So he ran his classes. And perhaps he ran his classes in the mornings. And in the afternoons, every day, Paul taught at the school, the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And the Bible tells us there, Acts 19, verse 8, and nine, he did this for two years. So can you imagine, daily he was teaching in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, preaching Jesus. And what happened? For two years, he never did this in any other city. The longest he stayed was at Corinth, see, uh, uh, 18 months, a year and a half. Now he's here in Ephesus for two years teaching at the school of Tyrannus. And what was the outcome? Verse 10 is so beautiful. 
it says, and all of Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. All of Asia. Now, of course, understand Asia. Uh, in Bible times, we're actually talking about Asia Minor, which is all about Turkey. It's like the an appendage to the real Asia, which Asia, as we understand, is more inland. But Turkey was called Asia Minor. So when the Bible is saying all of Asia, it's saying the word spread across all of Turkey. Paul was at Ephesians. Now I want to bring our attention to something very important. Remember in Acts 16, in the second missionary journey, twice Paul wanted to move into Asia, and both times the Holy Spirit said, don't go. Instead, he had a vision of a man from Macedonia, that's Eastern Europe, Greece, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so, it's a, he wanted to go into Asia, Holy Spirit said, don't go. So he had this vision, and he crossed over the Aegean Sea, went into Eastern Europe, and brought the gospel to Europe. That happened in the second missionary journey. And you can imagine, Paul must have been a little disappointed, maybe. Lord, I want you to go into Asia, and you sent me to Europe. Oh, it's okay. But Lord, what about Asia? When? When? And look what's happening now. Acts 19, verse 10. Paul is in one city, Ephesus. He's teaching the word. And the word from the school of Tyrannus has now gone across all over Asia. And you see the New Testament churches in the map there. All across, from Ephesus, you find Laodicea, Smyrna, um, uh, Colossae, Hierapolis. All these churches, Sardis, uh, all these churches right around Ephesus. What would have happened was the people who were coming there to the school of Tyrannus were trained by Paul. They went over and they started planting churches. Paul's desire, and I should say God's desire, is being fulfilled. But it's happening at a different time. He wanted to do it in a second missionary journey. But God is bringing it about in the third missionary journey in a way that he may not have even envisioned. The people being trained in the school of Tyrannus are now going and planting these churches. Paul meets Philemon, Epaphras, they're the ones who planted the church in Colossae. And Paul himself personally has never gone to Colossae. But he writes this letter to the church at Colossae, to the Colossians. Amen. So what do we understand? That God knows the timing and how to reach the nations. How to do it. Sometimes he says, don't go. Why? Because he knows how and when he's going to do it. And you see that actually unfolding here in Ephesians chapter 19 as, as, as these things are unfolding. Are you with me so far? So that's the first thing happening. Paul is teaching the word. People are being equipped and they are spreading the word across Asia. And that's something we are doing here at APC. I'm not promoting APC. I'm just saying we are following biblical pattern, right? We equip people here and then they go across the nation and, and churches are being planted and uh, churches are being strengthened and ministry is being, you know, we're just doing it from here and it's already happening. Amen? The other thing we see next, Acts 19, 11 and 12. It says, and God worked unusual miracles with the hands of Paul. So that from his hands, aprons and handkerchiefs were taken to the sick and those who were demon possessed and they were healed and delivered. So unusual miracles. God doing the supernatural. People, I know you can just imagine, people coming to Paul and saying, Paul, can you pray over this handkerchief? Can you pray over this cloth? I'm going to take it to, you know, so-and-so is not well. I'm going to take it to so-and-so is unwell. And God is working healings and miracles. The supernatural being uh, worked happening and while this is going on the next thing that happens is there are seven sons of a chief priest a high priest the seven sons of Sceva and they say hey Paul is using the name of Jesus to heal and deliver maybe we can also try it and so the next time they meet a demon possessed man they say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul is preaching, come out. And the demons inside the man reply, 
Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who are you? And the demons, one man, demon powered, jumps on seven men, rips their clothes apart, chases them out naked. And the news spreads all across Ephesus. And it says there in Acts 19, I think it's verse 16, that the name of our Lord Jesus was magnified. The name of our Lord Jesus was magnified. Verse 17, the name of Jesus was magnified. And what happened? A revival broke out in that city. A mighty move of God took place. So much so that it says all the people who were practicing witchcraft and black magic and doing all kinds of wrong things, they themselves, after hearing what had happened, the name of Jesus, the authority and the power of that name being demonstrated and the authority of the believer, you know, saying, Jesus I know and Paul I know. Paul's a believer. I know Jesus, I know Paul. The devil knows you. Tell your neighbor, the devil knows you. The devil knows you. He knows you're a believer and he's afraid of you. He's afraid of the Jesus in you. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So Jesus I know, Paul I know. Jesus I know, Sam I know. Jesus I know, John I know. Jesus I know, John C I know. <laughs> right? He knows you. And so the name of Jesus magnified, the authority of the believer was demonstrated and what happened? The whole city said, hey, our black magic, these things don't work. We have to follow Jesus. And they themselves, they themselves created a bonfire through all their things that they were using and they turned to the Lord. Amen? So now, when you read Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2, you can understand why Paul wrote that. Because in Ephesians 1, he's saying, Jesus, God has highly exalted him and made him to sit at his own right hand, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. He's affirming what he taught these believers. Hey, there may be gods and goddesses and names and authorities, but Jesus is at the Father's right hand, high above all these things. And chapter 2 says, by the way, you are also seated with Jesus in heavenly places. And you know, they've seen that. They've experienced that. The authority of the name of Jesus, the authority of the believer, they know it. They've seen it happen in their city. They saw the city shaken because of that name. And Paul is writing Ephesians from the prison, reminding them, don't ever forget where Jesus is seated and where you are seated. And then in chapter 6, I mean, I'm skipping the other chapters, but everything can be put in context. And in chapter 6, he tells them, you take on the full armor of God. You have nothing to be afraid of. There may be demons operating around you, but you put on the whole armor of God and you'll be able to stand against all the wiles of the enemy. For the Ephesians, it was pretty close at home because they were living among a community of people who were practicing these things. So now these believers say, my neighbor is doing this. My hey, put on the full armor of God. It doesn't matter what your neighbor in front of you, behind you, beside you is doing. The Bible says that you have the full armor the, the, none of the wiles of the devil can prevail. You will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Amen? That's what the Ephesians were living in. And Paul was affirming, you put on the full armor of God, you take on the shield of faith, you put on each and piece, every piece of armor, having done all, you stand and keep standing and none of those fiery doubts will touch you. They knew it for real. Amen? So they, there was such a big shift. So, Ephesians 19 it's a beautiful case study of spiritual transformation of a city in three years. Now, Paul tells us he stayed there three years. We will see that in chapter 20. But this city was dedicated to the goddess Diana. In three years, there was such a shift in the spiritual atmosphere over this city. And not just the city, but it says all of Asia, meaning from here, all of Asia was affected. 
And the next thing that we see, the rest of Acts 19, I'll mention this and I'll come back to the spiritual transformation point. But the next thing that you see happen, oh, let me just, sorry, let me just mention a few things. Paul spent three years in Ephesus. Another notable thing that happened while he was in Ephesus was some people came from Achaia, from Corinth, that's southern Greece, and they brought news to him about the church in Corinth. But this news was not good news. He mentions this. He says, you know, some of Chloe's household, they came to me and they told me what's going on there. They told me, and in the very first chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, they told me there are divisions among you. Some of you are saying, I'm of Paul. Some of you are saying, I'm of Apollos. Some of you are saying, I'm of Peter. He says, brethren, I, I, I beg you, be all of one mind, one heart. Speak the same thing. This is chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. And, 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 and there are so many other problems in the Corinthian church. So right there in Ephesians, while, it's three, while he was there for three years, he writes 1 Corinthians. And he sends it with Titus. He says, please take this letter back to the Corinthian church. And actually, in 2 Corinthians, he shares his heart feelings when he was writing 1 Corinthians. And you can read it. And he tells them, brothers, when I was writing 1, you know, it doesn't, these are not his literal words, but you can understand it. When I was writing that letter, I was broken. I was in so much sorrow when I was writing that letter. That means out of so much pain in his heart about what was going on in that Corinthian church. They were fighting and all other things were going on, wrong things. He said, I was just broken in my heart when I wrote that first letter to you. But then he commends them. He says, because when you received that letter, you also had great repentance. You turned back. You repented. You, 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 you know, made things right. But that was what was happening. He wrote that first Corinthians from Ephesians. The other very important thing that happened at Ephesians, and we'll come to this a little later, is that Paul raised up the next generation of Christian leaders at Corinth, at Ephesians. From Ephesians, we read about some names. We read about uh, uh, someday, we, we, will, we will come to this later. But while he was at Ephesus, towards the end of his three years there, Paul purposed or determined that he was going to go across to Macedonia, which had the churches of Thessalonica, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. And he wanted to go into Achaia, which had the churches at Corinth and Athens and St. Crea. He, he purposed that he would go there. But he sent Timothy and a man called Erastus ahead of him. And one of the things he wanted them to do was to take up an offering, collection, so that when Paul came through, he would then take that collection back with him to give to the church in Jerusalem. Are you with me? So he sent Timothy and Erastus across. Now, the reason I want to highlight that is this man Erastus was no ordinary man. He actually was from Corinth and he was actually a city councillor, a, a very important person in the city council of Corinth. Must have been a wealthy man. Because what was found archaeologically, and I think I mentioned this last Sunday, they found a pavement and, and they found this big stone on which was inscribed, this payment was laid, and I'm just paraphrasing it, this payment was laid by Erastus, the city councillor. Because he was, you know, he was the city councillor. It was laid by him at his own expense. So he must have been not only a high official, but also a wealthy man. But what was he doing? He was with Paul at Ephesus serving. And Paul was sending him on an assignment with Timothy. Hey, you go over there to the churches in Macedonia, take up an offering for the churches in Jerusalem, I'll come. So even people like this were being trained by the Apostle Paul during his time at Ephesus. 
Are you listening? This is very important. We'll come back to it. And so, while Paul was getting ready to make his trip out of Ephesus, something happened. This is where business, religion, and politics collide. There were a lot of business people at Ephesus who were making a lot of money by making artifacts of the goddess Diana. And suddenly sales went down. Because people were now following Jesus. Nobody was coming to buy those things. And one man, Demetrius, he said, hey guys, he instigated all the other businessmen. Hey, we're losing money. But then he wrapped it up in a religious proposal. Because hey, God, soon God is Diana. Who's our God is, every, people stop worshipping her. So he stirred them all up. A big mob arose and they wanted to, you know, it was all against Paul, of course. But Acts 19.31, a very interesting verse. It says that Paul had friends who were officials of Asia. That means he had friends in high places. They were not just officials of Ephesus, the city. They were officials of Asia. In other words, if Paul wanted to do something, he could have pulled, like we say in today's time, he could have pulled some strings. Isn't that right, Rachel? He could have pulled some strings with these high officials. That verse 31 says, and some of the officials who, of Asia, who are his friends, told Paul, don't get involved. And I, I, for some reason, I like that. A preacher should not get involved with politics. Just stay out. Mind your own business. Preach the word. See, Paul, he could have gotten involved. He could have got all these officials involved. No. They told him, just stay out. Don't get involved. As a pastor, as a preacher, as a minister of God, you're called to preach and teach the word. Now, you can minister to people in power to help them in their faith. But don't stand there and promote some politician. Don't desecrate your calling. No, enough. I'm, I'm really get stirred up on that. Keep it aside. But look at that example of Paul. Don't get involved, Paul. Stay out. And the city clerk came forward. He told the people, Look, if you've got any problem against Paul, the courts are there, the judges are there, go file. And he dismissed them. So that uproar was put down and Paul moves from Ephesus. He now crosses the agency, gets into Macedonia. So this comes, brings us into chapter 20. So he goes across now into Greece, the northern part of Greece, the district of Macedonia, and he visits those churches. He obviously goes through Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. Now when he's there in Macedonia, Titus comes back to him in Macedonia with news about the Corinthian church. He says, I delivered your letter to them. All of them repented and they've fixed things. Uh, they, they have really taken your letter to heart. So from there in Macedonia, he writes a second letter, Second Corinthians, and he sends it back with Titus, saying, Titus, take this letter back to them. So 2 Corinthians were, was written from there, saying, hey, I am so glad that, you know, you received, and I'm just part of somebody, there's a lot of things there, but he, he, he just appreciates them that they received this correction and they responded. And he sends a letter back with Titus to go back to the Corinthian church. So he spent some time in Macedonia and then he himself goes down to southern Greece, which means he would have spent three months there, the Acts, Acts 20 says. He spent three months in Greece, which means he visited the churches at Athens, Corinth, and St. Crea. But this is where, in verse 4, I want you to look at, the names of many young men who were being trained by Paul are mentioned. And this is outstanding. Uh, and I'll just read some of those names there. These are all Greek names, so... Uh, they would sound different for us. It was four, actually, verse four, and so Pater of Berea, 
Aristarchus and Secundus of Thessalonians, Gaius of Derby, Derby is over there in Galatia, and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimius of Asia. So these are some men. You can add to this list, you know, Titus, Epaphras, Philemon, uh, other men, other names. But why are these names important? These were men whom Paul had taken from all these different churches that he had planted. Notice they are all from different churches. But they were working alongside Paul. They spent about three years with him in Ephesus. They have traveled over now into Macedonia. Now they're traveling down into Achaia and they actually travel back with him into Asia. They're all with him. And this is where in his third missionary journey at Ephesus, the next generation of Christian leaders have been raised up. Are you listening? And this is so important because Paul, I'm sure, didn't know that in 10 years from then, he and Peter were going to be beheaded by Nero in Rome. Peter was, you know, Paul was beheaded. Peter was burnt on at the stake. But in 10 years from then, both the main Christian leaders were going to die in Rome. They probably didn't know it. But they were doing something that would secure the future of the church. They were raising up the next generation. Are you listening? How did Paul do this? Paul gives us some insight when he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. He says, Timothy, you have carefully observed my teaching, my manner of life, my faith, my love, my endurance, my purpose. In other words, who was Timothy? Remember he picked him up on a second missionary journey. Timothy was alongside Paul in all these travels. He was going with Paul, working with Paul. Paul sending him on assignments. Timothy, you go ahead, take this letter, do this. And, and like Timothy, there was Titus and there were all these other men who were alongside him. That's how he raised up these leaders. They saw his life. You know, Paul wasn't living in the crystal cathedral somewhere. Every Sunday morning, he would descend from the clouds. Holy and anointed one. And deliver the message and then disappear somewhere. No. It was like, hey, we work together. We travel together. We, we go through hardships together. We study together. You hear me teach. You might hear me preach the same message in all these churches over and over again. But you get it finally. Are you listening? That's how we nurture people. That's how you raise up. And that's why I love it when, you know, our young people, we travel together. We are going to Velo. Um, I don't know when. When is it, John T? 27. So we take, uh, some of us are going to Velo on a mission trip. I mean, we'll sit in the train together. They might hear me snore. And, <laughs> I don't know. But that's how we do things together. You know, you know sometimes we've traveled places. We go, the auditorium is a mess. We all take the broom, clean up the mess, have our meetings. We travel, we do these things. That's how these people are being raised up. Amen. And they are our future leaders. From time to time, you know, I spend time, we have a youth leaders meeting. They come, they just ask questions. It's okay, it's our time. We, we talk about different topics. We give them time to ask questions. We answer. But that's the way. It's life to life. You let them see what you go through. And I love it, you know, when our church staff, we have about 30 of us, you know, they, they see me, you know, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, they can see me in my good times, my bad times. I can't hide it. I'm there. And they're all around me. They can see me when I get upset. And I have to, you know, oh God, give me grace. <laughs> I mean, they see, but that's how they learn. They see when we talk and discuss about difficult situations. Uh, how do we solve it? They are there in those discussions. They hear how we process information. They're there in those meetings. But that's how they're being nurtured throughout the week. Same thing with our Bible college. You know, when these students come next Sunday, they'll be here serving. Well, you know, in the Bible college, we make them clean the floor, arrange the chairs, clean the toilets. Do it. That's part of your training. You think, I came to learn theology. Yeah, part of your learning theology is sweep the floor. 
if you can't sweep the floor, and we've dismissed students because they refuse to work, sweep the floor. Say, go home, you're not fit. At least not at APC. If you cannot take the mop and sweep the floor, swap the floor, clean the thing, you're not fit. We have sent students home because they refuse to do that. They said, we came to study. Yeah, but this is part of your training. I know many of you will now think twice. <laughs> but, but, but this is how you get trained. Seriously. Because that's what ministry involves. Amen. And that is how Paul raised up this next generation in those three years at Ephesus. So now Paul, you know, is, is now in Corinth and his original plan was from Corinth, I will sail back to Jerusalem. But what happened? He realizes there are people who are plotting to kill his life. So he changes course. He goes back up to Macedonia. He goes back to Philippi. He had left Luke there in Philippi on a second missionary journey. So Luke joins him. And this whole team is traveling with him. They change course. They go up to Macedonia. And from Macedonia, instead of sailing directly to, you know, back to uh, Jerusalem, they sail over to Troas. And he had spent time there in the second missionary journey, Troas. And Troas, Paul is having one night there. The believers gather together. And, you know, in the evening after they've had their supper, maybe at 6 p.m., he starts his sermon. And remember, we preach the everlasting gospel. So Paul started preaching six o'clock, about 6 o'clock in the evening. And he's still preaching 12 at midnight. Still going on. And there was a young man there, Eutychus. Said, Paul, this is getting long, man. <laughs> and he was sitting on the window ledge. Just nodding off. He says, you must be watching like, you know, this sermon, no ending. And suddenly he falls off the third floor window. Now we don't know for sure whether he actually died. Seems like he died, but Paul stops the sermon, goes down, brings him back to life. We think so, we're not 100% sure, but he comes back to life. And then Paul goes back up and continues the sermon for another six hours. <laughs> Till the break of day. I mean, like, thank God we don't have such long services. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm just joking. But can you imagine starting off in the evening till the break of dawn next day preaching? But that's Paul's heart. Sharing with them. And so from Troas, after that, he, he stops at several seaports along uh, the western coast of Turkey. And he comes to the seaport of Miletus. And from there, which is about 30 miles from Ephesus, he calls for the elders of the church. So remember, in three years at Ephesus, he has also raised up local leadership. So he calls for the local leadership. And what he tells them, Acts 20, 17 to 38, is a very touching passage. I would encourage us to read that. I'll just summarize that and then we'll close. As Paul begins talking to these leaders, remember, they have seen him for three years. And Paul says, remember, what does he do? First, he points to his life. Remember how I have lived before you in all humility. So, so, you saw me. Three years I was here. You saw me. You saw my life. And as leaders, this is a powerful passage. People will forget every sermon you preached or almost but they will never forget the life you lived. Amen? The Hebrew, the Greek, the deep explanations, revelations, all that will be erased. They forget. Say, so you said it. But your life, the life you lived in front of them, they will not forget. And that's what Paul is telling them. You saw my life. And then he says, I taught you publicly and from house to house. And I shared with you the full counsel of God. I gave you everything I know. I taught you everything. And then he warns them about their responsibility. He says, now I'm going to Jerusalem. Acts 20, verse 28, uh, verse 20. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I am bound in my spirit. The Holy Spirit is telling me, you know, when I go to Jerusalem, there's going to be trouble. But I don't count my life dear to myself. I'm ready to do this for the sake of the gospel. So he says, I know what I'm going to go into. 
There's trouble waiting for me in Jerusalem. But I'm going there. I have work to do. And Paul's plan was go to Jerusalem. From there go to Rome. From there go to Spain. He writes about that in Romans 15. So that was his plan. So he knows what he's getting into. But then he warns these leaders. He says, Take heed. This is verse 28. Acts 20. Take heed to yourselves. And he says, shepherd, watch over the flock of God. Among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The Holy Spirit has appointed you. So Paul didn't say, I appointed you. No, the Holy Spirit appointed you. Watch over these people. Shepherd the flock of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So he's telling them, you know, these are God's people. Holy Spirit has given you a responsibility. These are God's people. You take care of them. He's bought them with his own blood. That's how valuable they are to God. So you watch over them. He says, because I know after I go, the savage wolves will come. People will come. They'll want to disturb this. They'll want to confuse people. They'll want to take people away after themselves. So you've got to shepherd the people. And what does he tell them to do? Verse 32. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. That means be rooted, be established in his word. That's what he tells them. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. In other words, you be committed to the word of God. That's it. Take care of God's people. And then in his ending note, it's very touching. He says, you know, that in these three years, I have coveted no man's gold or silver or clothing. But my own hands have provided for my own needs. And we saw this last time, Acts 18. How in every church, every place where Paul went, in Thessalonica, at Corinth, and now again we're reading it in Ephesians, Paul did manual labor. That's what he's talking about. Acts 20. It says, my own hands provided for my own needs and for those with me. He was fixing tents. He was working on leather things. That was manual labor. Now, at least today we can go sit in an AC office and write code. Yeah. Those days, that's hard work. Hard work. So Paul is telling, that means three years in Ephesians, he was Working day and night and at the same time every day preaching and teaching the word of God for three years. Imagine. He did that, you know, like in all the other places he refers to. And again in Ephesians, he says, you know what I did. I worked with my own hands and I established the church. And not just the church, all of Asia was affected. And I want to repeat what I said last Sunday. Your calling, your anointing is not going to get affected just because you have to do some work. Amen? That's what Paul did. He didn't say, oh, I lost my apostolic calling. I lost my apostolic anointing because I was fixing tents. No. Maybe your apostolic ministry became stronger because you were fixing tents. So many of you, you are professionals. You know, you may be, you're tent makers in a different sense. But understand the call of God is on your life. Some of you may be called by God to be apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers. You may be a school teacher. You may be a businessman. You, whatever. You may be some of that. Don't think your involvement in business or you know, whatever trade you're involved in is going to compromise your calling. No. Look at Paul. So rise up in both areas. Rise up in your profession. Rise up in your career. And rise up in the call of God. And he will use you to impact cities, nations, and regions. Amen? And that's what Paul is, is mentioning. Worship team, please come. So in closing, I want to just focus on certain key highlights here from these two chapters. The key lessons and insights. And I want to, first of all, talk about spiritual transformation. Paul spent three years in Ephesus. The city was transformed. Uh, how long have you and I have been in Bangalore? Has Bangalore been transformed? Not yet. <laughs> but what can we understand? What did Paul do 
that transformed the city of Ephesus. Now, of course, Ephesus is not as anywhere close to how big Bangalore is. Historically, Ephesus at that time had about 250,000 people, that we will say 2.5 lakh people. Our city, Bangalore, is about 14 million. But what are the insights we can gain? How did Paul work? How did the city transform? First, what did he do there? There was the teaching of the word of God. Second, there was the raising up of younger leaders who not only went, not only Ephesians, but they spread the word all across Asia Minor. That happened. Third, we see the supernatural, unusual miracles, and we need to ask God, Lord, we want to see unusual miracles. Can we make that? I know we pray, but we should do more. God, we want to see unusual miracles. And fourth, the authority of the name of Jesus was demonstrated. Jesus I know, Paul I know. The authority of Jesus and that of the believer was demonstrated in the city. So I would point to these four things as keys that actually affected the city of Ephesus. It once was the city of the goddess Diana. By the time you come to end of Acts 19, those people are scared like, hey, the city is shifted spiritually. Spiritually shifted. Can you and I, for our city of Bangalore and our region of India, pursue these four things? Lord, we be faithful to your word. We will nurture leaders who will multiply what we're doing. We will seek God for even more demonstration, unusual miracles. And we want to see the authority of the name of Jesus and the life of the believer demonstrated. Let people see it. Amen? You're not excited? Yes or no? So we're not studying Acts just to know history. We're saying, God, that is our DNA. It has to be reproduced in us. It has to happen again and again and again in us. Acts is our DNA. This is who we are. So we have to pray. We've been too long in Bangalore. And the spiritual trans- city, a city spiritually still needs a lot of work that you and I are here. The second insight I want to point out is how Paul nurtured the next generation. It was life to life. I mean, yes, we do have Bible college and, you know, we have all that, that formal training, which he did at the school of Tyrannus. But I think a lot of learning happened as these people just rubbed shoulders with Paul. They bumped into him and he bumped into them. And it was that life-to-life journey that brought about that nurturing of the next generation. That's what we must see happen. Amen. And the last thing I want to point out is the heart of a leader, which is what Paul expresses in Acts 20, 17 to 38. This is my life. This is what I did. This is how I lived. That's Christian leadership. Amen. That's the kind of leadership that we need to see in the church. Paul had friends in high places, but he never used that to promote the gospel. He didn't have the false belief that politicians can bring about spiritual transformation. No. Let politicians do their job. You do your job. Spiritual transformation happens through the church. Not by engaging the politicians. We don't need them. They need us to help them spiritually. But we don't need politicians to bring about spiritual transformation. Are you understanding? Spiritual transformation happens as we teach the word. We nurture up leaders. We let the supernatural power of God work. That's how cities and regions are transformed. Amen. We serve people in high places. We bless them, but we are their servants to help them spiritually, support them spiritually. But don't think they are going to bring spiritual transformation. No. That's right, sir.
As you stand here this morning, I want you to embrace your call. Don't think you're just a believer. Oh, I just go to church on Sunday and no, you are called by God. You are anointed by God. It doesn't matter what vocation you have. You could be a tent maker like Paul. You could be a teacher. You could be, you know, doing whatever work that you're skilled to do. But you are anointed. You're called. You're favored. And there are mighty things that God can do through you. And God used Paul in so many cities to establish such a great work. The same God is moving in our midst today. The same God is moving by His Spirit. The same God is stirring up gifts and callings. The same God is awakening you to what He wants to do through you. Like Paul told the Ephesians, that God is able to do above all, beyond all that we can ask or think or imagine by His power that's at work in us. He's able to do beyond your highest dreams, your highest prayers, your highest hopes. He's, he's able to do beyond all that. That's the God who's at work in you. So this morning, awaken. Awaken the dreams. Awaken to the call. Awaken to the anointing that's on your life. And even though you may be engaging in some work, let the God of heaven release his purposes through you. And Father, we also pray, God, that just like we saw in Acts 19, work unusual miracles even right here this morning. Work unusual miracles amongst us, Father. Even as we sing right now, I ask that people be healed. I ask that people be delivered. I ask that tumors disappear. I ask that bondages be broken in the name of Jesus. I ask that depressions and heaviness of the, of the mind be broken. Every yoke of the enemy on people's minds and emotions be broken in the mighty name of Jesus. We command spirits of infirmity to leave in the name of Jesus. And Lord, let chronic illnesses be healed. Things that have been affecting the bodies for a long time. Today, by the power of the name of Jesus, let those things be broken. Right here, right now, Lord, in this place. Let unusual miracles take place. Those watching online, let them experience the unusual miracle working power of God breaking through right where they are. And God awaken people to your prophetic, to their prophetic destiny, God. But you have predetermined, pre-appointed, pre-planned for them. Awaken them to that destiny today. Behold the cross that leads to a and never by The dead are raised, the sinner saved, the work of your power. Behold the cross, behold the cross. Another by hour. The dead are raised, the sinner saved, the work of your power. And God, your soul.
Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. And thank you, Father, that even as we are standing here in your presence, that your healing virtue touches our bodies, our minds, and the power of your Spirit that destroys every yoke and removes every burden, touches our lives, touches those watching online, that we experience God the deliverance that comes from you the healing that comes from you right here in this place and thank you for people being awakened to their destiny thank you for people your people God being awakened to the call that's on their lives heavenly purposes that they must pursue thank you for awakening people Thank you that each one here, God, will have impact, will have influence for your kingdom, wherever you've placed them, whatever vocation you've given them, whatever, whatever opportunities they have, that they will be movers and shakers for your kingdom. That in this day, in this hour, they will fulfill divine destiny. They will carry out heavenly purposes. That they will do things that cause the name of the Lord Jesus to be glorified and the word of the Lord to spread across our city, our nation, and the nations. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Before we close, we just like to Give an invitation to anyone here. You've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior. Maybe you're just visiting church. or Maybe you've been visiting a few, few times. And, but you've never turned away. Like we heard today, 
turned away from other things that you were depending on and turning to Jesus. But this morning you feel in your heart, I need to do that. And if you've never done that before in your life, I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. And if you feel prompted in your heart that, hey, today I must turn to Jesus. I need to put everything else aside. Throw it into the bonfire. I don't need that. But I need Jesus. If you've never done this before and this morning you feel prompted in your heart to do it, I want to lead you in a simple prayer to receive Jesus Christ into your life and become His disciple. If you've never done this before, and you feel that you want to do it, just say this with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins. I turn away from everything else. I turn to you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray this prayer with me for the very first time, I want to see your hand. The Bible says there's great rejoicing in heaven, even over one person who does this. Anyone here, you did this for the very first time, just put up your hand. We just want to celebrate with you. Anyone else? Anyone here this morning? You prayed this prayer with me for the very, very first time. Just wave your hand at me. Anyone here this morning? And you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. We have uh, a special bag that we want to give to you of free resources. So we want to make sure you get that. Anyone here who pray, prayed with me for the very first time? Okay. I don't see any hands here and that's fine. But if you did pray, please don't leave this auditorium without meeting one of our ushers, one of our greeters. They have a bag, or they have a set of books that they, we would like to gift you. They'll help you grow in your faith. There's also a little card where you can just write your name and number so that somebody will call you from the church office and, and tell you how to use these resources. So if you did pray that prayer with me, please make sure you get this before you leave. Right? Let's close with a benediction. please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit continue with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcw.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.